Okay, cool. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Nico Slebus. I work for a company called Slash IT Systems as well as for another company called the Pace Systems. Um, mainly we're doing online transaction processing of um, medical aid claims. So we're basically the middleman between the pharmacies, the doctors and the medical aids. <coughs> we focus mainly on the rest of Africa, north of South Africa, but we do have clients in South Africa as well. So I'm going to focus mainly on my role as a developer and how I use Linux in my daily life. Um, so we're going to... I'm just going to give you a brief introduction from where I started with it. In the first in 2001, I think that was when it was still very new to most people. Um, we saw at that stage you weren't even allowed to touch it. The sysadmin was there and he made sure you don't do something that you're not supposed to do. So we had um, an honors lab at university. We were allowed to use some of these Linux machines back then to access basically our emails. Then after that, we st started working and I got home and uh, my first versions of Linux that I used was Warrior Hedgehog or Ubuntu and there after Breezy Badger for a few years. And then I decided now it's time to move on. Um, but unfortunately, first of all, I had to use what the company was giving us to use for development. So I was using Windows XP and 7 and 8 for a while. 2002, I started tinkering with um, Gen2 Linux on my desktop at home. Then, the, when I in 2015, um, after con eventually convincing them, I started using Linux on my laptop, and I then I initially went for Sabi on Linux. It is a derivative of Gen2, but they do make a few things easier to do. When I'll come to it, when we compare all these different or the free distributions that I'm using, um, we'll get to the details of what's different between them. So about two years ago, I started using Arch Linux on my laptop, um, and that's what I'm still using today. Just not really part of the talk, but I think all of us at home, we've got some sort of internet connection, you've got a router there, so in everyday life, we're actually your own IT specialist. You have to be the DBA sometimes, your network administrator, the system administrator, because you're, you, I think, responsible for your security at home. You've got how many devices from cell phones and laptops that connect to the Wi-Fi, and I think it's your responsibility to know what's happening on that network. I mean, that's easy for other people to break in if you don't know what's going on in your own systems. So what do I use at home? I actually work mostly from home as well. So I've got a custom built firewall that serves up DNS, DHCP, uh, NTP, and if we have to uh, open VPN server, <coughs> this all run on a bare bones machine with Gen2 Linux. Okay, it does have, I'll, the nice thing about it, I can do with it what I want to now and install the necessary stuff. You don't get the extra bloat with it. Okay, then the NAS system on at home, it's not really Linux, but it does use open source software. It's a free BSD based <coughs> NAS called NAS for free. They've changed the name recently. I'm not sure what it is. I just saw that they did change the name, but it's still the same software underneath. Um, my desktop at home is still a Gen2 based box uh, with KDE on it. I use that mainly for browsing internet and doing a few other things, personal stuff. Um, this security camera that I have at the front gate also uses some version of a custom built Linux kernel and operating system that runs on it. The voice over IP phone is also using a Linux kernel. The Wi-Fi access point has a Linux kernel in it. So what I get that there's a lot of Linux stuff around us, even if we don't know it. Okay, it might just seem like some custom application and hardware, but it actually runs on Linux most of the time. Then also I've got two Raspberry Pis at home. The one I use for monitoring some of these systems with uh, stuff called GKRL M. Um, and that, okay, that uses Arch Linux as well with uh, LXDE desktop environment, and that also displays 
the video from the camera. And then lastly, the Raspberry Pi 3, um, I use as a multimedia player with Libri Elec as the open source um, system on that, and that actually also works quite nicely. Okay, so like I said, I'm a developer, so that's the software that I use on a daily basis. We are working remotely, so there is other applications that we need for that. For example, um, we get to the bottom here, like Slack, Team Viewer, Zoom, Skype, all those things I need to access if there's problems, say, at the remote site. We need to connect to a client and help them with some remote support. Mainly then Java, Eclipse, IDE, Postgres is a database that we're using. Wildfly application server is the stuff that I really need to be up to date and as stable as possible when I need to use them. Um, then in the service, we've got about 20 Gen2 installations that run the um, applications on in the environments but they now, okay, the 20 is distributed between the dev system, the test, and then the production system. There's uh, one in Ubuntu instance that we use as a um, VPN server to, to clients that requires us to have a VPN connection to them. Okay, so that's more or less what I'm using daily. I just want to do a quick survey in terms of corporates and stuff. How many of you are in, say, desktop, the general usage, you're not say the finance guys, HR, admin, how many of them are actually using Linux? Okay, so there's a few of them. Okay, the desktop IT team and the developers, do they have a choice between Linux, Microsoft? So I feel just a few there. So most of them use what the company is telling you to use. Okay. Um, your server infrastructure? Mostly Linux? Cool. Um, and those that you use cloud stuff, also Linux? Okay, so the majority of us do use Linux in our everyday lives. Okay, so what I'm going to do and what we'll, okay, we've got enough time, I think. So, if there's questions in between, when I start now with the comparison between those three operating systems I've used in between, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions then so that we can maybe explain it then and later you might have forgotten what your question was. So, an important thing, so with the release policies and what I mean with the release policy, how often do we get updates? Ubuntu, for example, you get every six months, you get your updates. It's Gen2, Sabion, Arch Linux, all we use what we call a rolling up, um, update policy. It means you install the system once and you get updates basically every day, depending on how quickly the um, package maintainers release new versions of their software. Okay, and that's especially important for me as a developer because I want to make sure I've got the latest stuff that I need to test with. Okay, if you're running other applications that you might not need it, it's highly dependent on what your use case is. Yes, um, just there's a mic we need to get to you. Um, if you're doing rolling uh, releases, uh, well, in, in terms of updates, um, how does that affect kernel updates? Can you sort of block kernel updates for a while until you know your, your apps and everything are ready to come across? Um, you can, and that's, uh, it's one of the, um, we'll get to it, but yes, you can block certain kernel updates if you want to, and only install them when you're ready. Um, and based, and it's on Arch Linux, not really as easy, but it's easier on the other two, for, um, it's really easy to do. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, just to answer there, on Arc Linux, you have your LTS kernels, which uh, yes, don't of course. update that yeah. much. And that yeah, you can, much. yeah. Yes. There's always a, the long-term support kernels that you can also install, which will take longer for updates there. And keep you on a more consistent version, but yes. That actually applies to all three of them. They all support um, long-term kernels as well, so. 
Okay. Um, architectures, um, Gen 2, I've used 32-bit, 64-bit, but, but actually, you name an architecture, they can support it. Whether it's ARM, RISC, Spark, some fancy stuff you've never heard of, they actually support it, and that's the reason for that is that all the packages are compiled from source on the host machine. Okay. Savvy on Linux, only um, 686, as well as Arch Linux, only 64, but they've dropped the 32-bit support last year. Um, the East community um, support for the Raspberry Pi on um, Arch Linux, but it's not the mainstream, guys. It's a community effort for maintaining Arch Linux on the Raspberry Pi. Um, okay, like I now said, oh, Gen 2 source packaging, so you can have to compile everything on your host machine. There is ways of, if you have the same, how can I say, exact same hardware, you can compile it once and distribute the binary package to the other. So there is a way around it. You don't have to compile it on the whole cluster, but their, their philosophy is compiled from source. Um, Savvy on Linux mostly is binary packages that is pre-compiled because they only support certain architectures. And, but if necessary, you can compile from source if the package isn't available in the repositories and you have the source code for it, you can compile it. Um, Arch Linux, the same story. They distribute um, pre-built binaries every um, day, basically. And then there is the option from the Arch, um, Arch user repository, you can get software and compile the source code um, directly from there. Um, in this time that I've used Linux, I've only used, um, or mainly used KDE. The first few Ubuntu versions was on GNOME, but yeah, I haven't used it in a long time. I'm quite happy with KDE at the moment, so I'm not planning on switching to anything at a soon. Then the installation process, and I think this is where um, many people have a gripe against a Gen 2, for example, because you have to do everything manually. There's no installation scripts that will shortcut a few things here. You have to set up the partition tables. You have to tell it you want this NTP server. You have to set up DHCP. Um, your network interfaces you have to configure if the defaults aren't um, working for you. Savvy on Linux, it's more focused on a desktop, so there is some of those stuff that are automated. You can tell it to install, and it will create some partition tables to automatic networking. Um, you can also, there's live CDs for that that you can use. So it will even, the live CD, you can boot off a USB if you have to, um, which makes it a bit easier than the Gen2 Linux to install. But again, with Gen2, then you have control over everything that's on your machine. Um, Arch Linux, the same. You can. It's also a bare bones type distribution. You add to it what you want on it. Um, there is a few installer scripts around, like Arch Anywhere, that do some of the stuff and give you a choice of, say, a desktop environment that you want to run. So you can have KDE, GNOME. I think they support LXDE as well and a few other desktop environments, so you can have that installed as part of the initial installation. Okay, then package manager, that's the thing that handles all the software on your system. Now, Portage is the one that's used by Gen2, and it's a rather powerful thing um, together with all the software um, that's installed with the Gen2 um, Gen toolkit you can do pretty much anything with that package manager. You can search for a file that's, and find out to which package it belongs, or if you have a package name, you can see all the files that, is, um, or that belong to that specific package. Um, Savvy on Linux has got two package manager, Portage and Entropy. They prefer that you use Entropy, okay? But you can use Portage as well. There is people that actually use both simultaneously, although they discourage you from doing that. Okay, so you, if you do both, you, I think you're responsible for what's going wrong there. Okay, package, oh sorry, um, Arch Linux uses Pac-Man. Also rather, I won't say it's, it's not the, doesn't have this 
it does have the same capabilities that Portage has. It doesn't feel like it. Okay, your options is a bit less than what you have with Portage, and what makes it more difficult or gently more difficult is you have to sometimes use different tools to find some of the information. Um, but once you get used to that, that's also not a big problem. Then in terms of the packages that are available for the distribution, um, Gentoo is actually quite good with the amount of packages and, or software that's available for it, the source code for it. Um, I've rarely found something that I need to find in a very weird place to find the software that I need for something. Um, Sabi on Linux, a little less of the software that is available to them because I also do binary because they do binaries, um, there's only so many people that compile some of the software. So if you can find a source code, you're welcome to compile it yourself. Then on Arch Linux, there's actually probably, I think it's the sec second biggest um, software repository is what they call the Arch user repository. There's about 47,000 packages in there. So I have yet to found some or f look for something that's not in there or not in the base system of um, Arch Linux. Okay, there's also now, if you look at this init system used, Gen2 prefer using OpenRC, it does support the newer system D, although it's not yet the default. They are planning on making it a default at some point, so I'm not sure when that will happen. Um, Sabi on Arch Linux both uses system D. Um, yeah. Some people like it, some people hate it. I guess if it's a personal preference in the end. So, in terms of design, Gen2 Linux is of user philosophy. You do with it what you want with it. Okay, so you have full control about everything you do on your machine, from the kernel being installed, from source code, uh, source packages that you compile. Um, Sabi on Linux for in that has a few things pre-configured um, based on this on some of the options you choose while installing it. Arch Linux the same is a bare minimum installation. You add to it what you want and when you want it. You don't need to do everything up front as you require you software you can add it. Licensing Gen2 also uses only free software. There is um, in the Gen2 kernels, there is some of the binary blobs, so but you, uh, there is an option to install the vanilla kernel that doesn't have those binaries in it. Um, Sabion uses mainly GPL packages and Arch Linux also GPL. Okay, um, like I said, your control over the OS on Gen2 Linux, you've got control about everything you do, from your boot uh, bootloader whether you want grub, live, or whatever you want to install there, to the kernel, to every piece of software. Um, on Sabi on Linux, they take a little bit of those decisions away from you. Um, and Arch Linux, the same thing. They, they have a default kernel that, they, for example, that they install, and, um, but you are welcome to change that as well if you want to, and you can have the same control over that system as you have with um, Gen2. Okay, then when we need to test or test new um, software, I sometimes need different versions of certain applications to run or be available for testing some of these packages. Okay, so Gen2 provides a thing that they call slots. So you can install multiple versions of the Postgres database, for example, on the same machine and none of the binaries will interfere with the other versions binaries. Okay, so that makes it quite easy for you to test um, your migration from one version of Postgres to another, to a newer version of the Postgres database. Unfortunately, that's the one thing that I found is lacking in Arch Linux. Okay, because they prefer you to keep up to date with the latest version. You can block future updates, but you can't run two versions of the same um, application um, inside the OS at, at a specific time. 
So I guess these days there is probably a workaround for that, and that's used to use containers to then run Docker and run two versions of a database or your application server for that matter. Um, with Gen2, you've got control over certain aspects of the software now. It's compiled what they call a use flag. Say, for example, you don't want um, any system D library on your Gen2 box. You tell it with the use flag, I don't want anything with system D to, on the system. You can customize it to say, use Pulse Audio or Ulsa. Um, use Qt4 or not use Qt5. All those are optional compiler flags that's passed to the um, C compiler, which will make your software um, binaries also smaller, and you have what you want on your system. With Sabion, you can do the same thing. Arch Linux, actually, unfortunately, you get the stock standard um, binary that's compiled by whoever set up the build process for that package. So normally you would get everything enabled um, for a package that you install. Um, okay, then if you, for example, don't want to install a specific version of, uh, of software in Gen2 and Sabion, you can what, mask that package and say, I don't want this version, or I don't want anything bigger than this version number. Um, also, all the, you can also mask older versions, it doesn't matter, um, but you have control over versions that's installed in your um, system. Arch Linux also gives you that capability with the ignore package um, configuration option where you can list certain versions. For example, you don't want the latest Postgres 11 coming. You um, can keep that off the, your development machine until you actually need it. Okay, then I think the other thing that that makes a huge difference in our daily lives. If you need to do something new, you're not sure what to do, you need good documentation. I have to say, um, the Arch Linux documentation is probably the best of the documentation I've seen. Um, you can uh, most, and then the Gen2 one is also to me rather good. I think there is, they do lack, sometimes lack, in certain areas, but I guess that's just whoever is doing the documentation that um, has to do that job. Um, Sabion mostly refer you to the Gen2 documentation because they are a derivative of Gen2. Um, okay, then partial updates. This is a big no in Gen2. Oh, sorry, in Arch Linux. Okay, so they always, if you install what's available from the package um, repositories, you're never supposed to have a partial update of the system. So you're not supposed to have a broken um, C compiler or something that's halfway. If something breaks halfway, you can redo that and you should um, get the correct package version. Um, on Gen2 and Sabion, for example, if that happens and it breaks something else, it's rather easy then just recompile that package from the source code. Whereas on Arch Linux, you will have to wait for the upstream maintainers to recompile a package. On Gen2, you have that capability to recompile that package immediately. And you can fix any problems with that. Java support is a big thing. Um, and this is one of the only instances that I can find where you can have multiple versions of it installed on Arch Linux. Okay, and that main reason for that is Java is a, a self-contained distribution. It doesn't depend on other um, system libraries and cross use um, between versions. So it's as easy as install a new version. You can create some links for different versions and use that and also by default, they give you the ability to choose your, your stock standard um, default implementation that you want to use. Um, Sabion in Gen2, as I said, you can, that's very easy to install different versions of any software on there. Okay, that went a lot quicker than I thought. 
Any questions? So I think there's time for plenty of questions, I think. Uh, you mentioned Arch Linux doesn't really support uh, multiple versions of Java, um, specifically for the, for the uh, so question. Sorry, it doesn't, or that, it does support? Uh, uh, sorry, it does, yes. Um, for the others, is it possible to use something like Java alternatives? Yes. It is possible. Yeah, you can, you can for example, install OpenJDK, you can install the Oracle JDK for Java 8. Both of them simultaneously, no problem. But, but you wouldn't run multiple at the same time. You would alternate between the, the two. Okay. Yes. Okay. You can start them. Or if one application has to use the Oracle JDK and the other one you can have to use, say, for example, Open JDK, you can use them both, but not on the same application. So, for example, Eclipse uses the one and your application server can use the other one. It just depends how you start it up, I would imagine, then. Sorry? It just depends how you would start it up, then. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. So I just have a question regarding live systems and production yes. systems. So if you're using Gentoo Linux, uh, my experience of it is it was a, uh, really hard to manage updates that the developers of the packages release early, and there's not enough testing, and then you hit that bugs. Um, do, you, do, you, do you have a solution for that, or how do you guys handle that? Um, even our OS upgrades goes through the same process as the development process. So we would firstly install um, the system updates onto our dev and test systems and leave it running for a month, two months, depends on um, what the system admin decides and depends on which packages were updated. If it's a, um, like we had last year with the open SSL issues, I mean, I think those things were done in two days' time. Um, but normally we leave them for those bugs to um, come out before we actually deploy to the production system. And I have to say, okay, maybe because we're not that dependent on OS um, packages, mainly because of Java, we really haven't had that issue. But uh, I guess that's dependent on um, which applications you use in your production environment. Okay, well, thank you. It's very useful information. Um, I know this is more of a technical talk, uh, so I do apologize for going into this category. Um, but gaming for things like or on things like OpenGPL, um, would you recommend any of these three, or would you rather recommend something like Ubuntu, which has a lot of uh, built-in drivers for gaming? Java specific or um, um, any kind of gaming, um, mostly on OpenGPL, since that's very uh, Linux. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, well, it depends on. I guess there's two or three things dependent on whether, for example, in your NVIDIA drivers, whether you use the open source driver or the propriety driver. Um, I've seen people say they've get, they get the mileage differ between the two, and it's also mainly dependent on that, um, the game they're trying to play. I think so, um, I probably wouldn't play games on Gen 2. It's more focused towards the server environment. Um, I guess any of the Ubuntu um, derivatives w w would work, even um, stuff like um, Linux, Mint, Cinnamon, those also. Um, I have no idea what games is like on f any of the Red Hat um, systems, but I guess Fedora would also probably work. And I think anything probably that targets a desktop environment would work, and I guess now with that Steam is porting more and more of these games to Linux, it might actually get better and better over time. All right, thank you. More questions? It's probably, what, another five minutes? Ten minutes, okay. All right, guys, thank you.